Good morning, afternoon, evening, or other time period, everyone, and welcome to Frame Rate, the show where we rate frames. I'm one of your hosts, Michael Swaim, and with me, as always, is my brother in arms. Say hey, b. Hey, b. That's right, it's Abe <laughs> Epperson, and I'm the other guy. I'm mm-hmm. the other guy on this podcast, Frame Rate, where we rate frames. And here comes a snooty film reference there's a third man. You seen the third man? I didn't care for it, Abe. That's not what we're talking about today, though, because we have (laughs) Mr. Zach Sherwin here. What? What? Hey, Zach, say hi. Hi, pals. Thanks so much for having me on. I've seen the third man. Oh, yeah. Hell What'd you yeah. think? I like people's capsule opinion of the third man. I always get confused <laughs> if whether that's the one with Orson Welles and or if it's the one with the like couple who drinks a lot and makes a lot of jokes. The it's, Thin yeah. Man, maybe? The, you're thinking the, of the Thin Man in the second case. Yeah, it's yeah, the Orson Welles one. I haven't seen the Thin Man. Yeah, it's the Orson Welles one. I wrote a it's paper kind of, about the yeah. third man. About the Ferris wheel Damn. scene in college. Really? Yeah. What did you say about the Ferris wheel scene? Do you remember? I, I it's pretty vague. Um, but uh, my memory, not the paper, it was very specific and exact. <laughs> um, my recollection is that there's like as the conversation, the famous scene with a high stakes conversation on a Ferris wheel. As it like, it's like heaven and hell stuff as the Ferris wheel goes up and lowers. Mm. And so you can like map the action of the, whether they're still ascending, stopped or descending to like yeah. where the conversation is going. And there's like info to be gleaned mm-hmm. from that text. Man. I have heard that argument before, actually. It's That's really good. Firmly out of bounds, like based on the scope of the episode, but so interesting. Should we just do a third man episode? We're guys? in the third man. The third man. You read re- Tokyo. <laughs> anyway, we're talking Tokyo Godfathers. That's right. That's what came out of the rabble. Um, but I just want to. Uh, right up top say how great it is to hear your voice Zach uh still a big fan as you as we said off mic haven't talked for years but man just good to see your face I'm moving my notes so I can see your face again yeah there he yeah. is his face. yeah we're old friends it, it's a nice testament to the durability of friendship that you and I haven't seen each other in such a long time but it's you know we're we know what we've yeah. been doing it's very comfortable and instantly back on and Abe we've just met but you seem great <laughs> and I look forward to some distant, oh, yeah. far-off future where we reminisce back about this. We're yeah, we're gonna have a whole adventure. It's gonna be crazy. Right. Yeah, it's interesting because it's if over the course of time, it's like a real friendship sutured together by lengths of parasocial friendship. Because I do vaguely know what you're doing at all times, even though we don't talk for four or five years. But anyway, right. Uh, and what lots I of don't surmising know, to fill in exactly. The gaps. Um, what I've been speculating on this entire time, and what I could never get my head around is. Hey, do you like Tokyo Godfathers? you have any interest in the film (laughs) Tokyo Godfathers? Where does that sit in your brain? I didn't have any interest or, frankly, know of its existence before you sent me a list of possible movies that we might talk about for this episode. (gasps) I hope that's not too far behind the curtain. But that's so cool. I have a cinephile buddy, and I sent that list to him. And I was like, which of the, ah. you know my tastes, which of these should I watch? Like a, like a human algorithm that you're friends with and has your best interests That's at heart instead of trying to, to make the buck off you. And he was, he actually, I, I just wanted him to send back like, here's one or two titles that I think you'd like. But he wrote a little capsule review of every movie on that list. I think because Whoa. it was fun for him. So if you want, I can send that along to you guys and you can uh, take a look at it. Please, cool. we might link that in the show notes. We'll see. I don't know if we want to reveal them all. That's a long ass list. Wow. I know. I couldn't believe it. I do want to see how the algorithm encapsulates each of those, though. The living algorithm. Awesome. The living algorithm. Okay, so what do you, so what do you say about options. Tokyo Godfathers? Yeah, that, that drew your interest. I'm going to look it up while we talk, and um, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll tell you what he has to say. But I think I was drawn to it mostly because... I had never heard of it, and it seemed like a movie that I would never watch without like an external prompt, such as like quote unquote mm-hmm. homework for a podcast. And so, um, sure. yeah. yeah, I just pounced. I never would have seen Tokyo Godfathers. I really think my whole life would have elapsed without me ever watching it, but that's not the life I wound up living. And that segues perfectly into it's a brisk 90 minutes, I think 92 minutes, credits Loved. roll. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's your initial impression? First blush. Um, I, well, here's what I have to say. I was instantly grabbed by how incredibly 
they were able to capture the nuances of human facial expression. I mm-hmm. guess we should say it's an anime. Mm-hmm. 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 And yeah. the art was so sophisticated. Like, I'm vaguely yeah. aware that, like, humans are really, really good at interpreting micro nuances of facial expressions, which means if you're animating those, you have to be, like, really nailing it or it's going to come mm, off right. in the uncanny valley somewhere. But whoever the artists were on that movie, I... um. I was really like instantly drawn in by that. And I also could tell from the music, which I liked a lot over underneath the credits, that this was not going to be a harrowing cinematic experience. It was going to be like, you know, there would be some emotion involved, but I was going to end it not feeling wrecked or Mm -hmm. punished for having chosen the movie. Let me say it kind of celebrates some things, but it also has an eye on certain, you know, pains of the human experience. It's very uh, I don't know. It's a very fundamental movie. I love that we have fresh eyes on it. We almost never get that. I'll say, uh, yeah, this was the first anime I, I ever saw that was quote unquote mundane. I think, uh, you know, I saw it life? as a young person and like, huh? Is slice of life like a yeah. term of art here? Mm-hmm. The stakes do rise to a point of like a Goonies style adventure where, mm-hmm. where lives are at stake and there's like mm-hmm. actual darkness and sadness for sure. But, uh, it really feels, I'll say, like the antidote to Grave of the Fireflies. If you've ever seen that, right. like if you if you end if you end up watching that, watch that first, then this, and your day might not be ruined. This will be like the cushion to <laughs> right. land the blood. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in a nutshell, it's about three unhoused folks who end up finding a baby in the dump. It's essentially the gang finds a dumpster baby. That episode mm-hmm. of Always Sunny, but with people who are good inside instead of <laughs> screaming at each other all the time and trying to do what's best for the baby. Uh, Abe, I put Tokyo Godfathers on the frame rate list, so I've also wondered for like the five years we've been doing this, what's Abe think about Tokyo Godfathers? Because oh, it's- yeah. It's. A, I think it's a delight. Uh, nice. The guy who made this, mm. or one of the people who made this, but like the director writer, is uh, Satoshi Kon, mm-hmm. uh, who also made Paprika, which he's usually sci-fi, right? Like, he's usually you see, weird sci-fi. Weird too. sci-fi, yeah, kind of like Akira-inspired kind of stuff. And he's and he worked for many years doing that. This is the only movie of his that is just like no magic, no sci-fi. Mm. It's just people in you know tokyo that's it and uh he he really wanted to talk about like unhoused folks there uh there and that's like what i find that resonates with me and about this movie most is that like he really just wanted to show like the expectation of people to be certain things when they're just not that he really likes to dip into that pain you know like there's the pain of expectation we have of other people, whether we're right or wrong. He just really dials into like, what does that mean socially? What is, what does it mean to have expectations of other people? And when you don't fulfill those expectations for others, like what's going on there. And I just love when uh, a filmmaker who's usually someone who's like, I just, I like to do the style thing. I like to do like the crazy shoot 'em ups or like, like the crazy 2001, you know, big baby in the sky sequences or something like that. Like it's not his calling card and he chooses this Mm -hmm. fucking nails it. I love it. Mm. And almost the appeal of animation is often that, right. It's so it's the same cost to draw a galaxy eating vampire as it is to draw just a room. And so when people do occasionally just draw people in rooms talking, uh, you're like, wow, that's kind of actually compelling in a way. Our sister network, right. Gamefully Unemployed, just said the same thing about Bob's Burgers, which I think is very true, where you're like, its defining feature is it's not the Simpsons go to Japan or the Simpsons or Homer yeah. becomes president. It's very low stakes. This feels like that. Uh, Zach, are you a David Lynch guy? I wouldn't characterize myself as such. No, <laughs> that's um, not I, your uh, first thing you <laughs> introduce yourself you're not to people. A David as. Lynch guy. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, David Lynch guy. Okay. Um, I like movies, and they're they feel to me like like I've never written a novel, but I'm like I understand. I think how I would like approach that if mm-hmm. someone gave me a book deal to do so, I could like see taking a stab or at least putting my first foot down. Movies sure. to me seem like 
literal science fiction magic. I cannot imagine making one. Um, mm. And so uh, I like that because I can experience movies without any like professional, um, like, how would I handle this? Do I think this is good? I'm purely a spectator in that regard. And so um, mm. all of which is to say I am also not totally expert and um, broadly versed in movies. I've seen in David Lynch or two, but um, sure. not a ton. Well, I bring it up because he has, you know, what he's known for, I'm sure. You've at least gained through like cultural osmosis for the ones you've seen, which yes. are these weird images driven dream fever dreams. Right. But uh, he has one called The Straight Story. That's just wow. about an old man who has to drive a tractor 400 miles to like accomplish some simple task. <laughs> and right. I just love when filmmakers do that. And this feels a lot like that to me. So I I get so anxious at movies that are like dream sequences and like the filmmaker indulging in like trippy nonlinear storytelling that I, I it's is difficult for me. And so I read after I watched Tokyo Godfathers that this was by far Satoshi <laughs> Kon's like most mm-hmm. Uh, straight ahead story and I was like oh my god I'm so glad I didn't pick the trippy freaked out fever dream one now I, I've done <laughs> psychedelics I'm interested in that stuff I yeah. just watching a movie of it in somebody else's makes me I'm like perspiring a little talking about it also really quickly before I hand over the talking stick it's so funny when someone asks you a question that they want you to just answer so they can like make the point and you're like are you a David Lynch guy and I'm like Kind of. I like movies for this reason. And if I got a book deal to write a novel, you're like, all I want to say is that David Lynch has one straight ahead film like Satoshi Kon. Not true, though. I mean, we as we discussed before taping, we're definitely about the navel gazing and the the unpacking of I think I said uh, that was more important than being a joke a minute. I actually take that back. Be hilarious from now on until the end of the podcast. (laughs) Yeah. And Uh, do some some prop comedy if you can. That's the point of watching a movie and talking about it with your friends as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Let me ask you this, Zach. Hmm. What what did you think of like the story itself? Like uh, because you mentioned the animation, but like and we've kind of talked about how this whole thing is like a pilgrimage, right? Mm. It's based off like the Three Kings myth. Uh, it's also based off a John I did Ford not film. even figure that out, dude. Oh, really? That's okay. so, yeah, of course mm. it is. Yeah, of it's, course. It's the, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> but like the story itself is just a simple story, right? It's it's they're trying to get the three. Uh, the three godfathers are trying to get this baby to where it belongs. And it just takes them on a crazy serendipitous journey. And we learn crazy things like, uh, you know, like the thing, the, the assumptions that they made about uh, getting this baby to the mother. It's like, Oh, it's not even the mother and stuff like that. So it's like, there's a lot of twists and turns. How did you feel navigating that? Like, was it like, did you, this is not a very typical Hollywood story. Obviously it wasn't even made there, but like, what did you, like, how did you, how did you digest that? Did that, did you enjoy the story? Yeah. Well, and I'll just quickly say that I have my friend Ian's email pulled up and he said, I don't love anime, but this is a fun spin on an old story. Um, that was his capsule when I, he got it. The list over. Yeah. I'm the only mm-hmm. dummy sitting here like, what? It's an analogy for something. <laughs> well, I, I know the thing Abe said just because I read mm-hmm. like one thing about it after I watched it, maybe even just the Wikipedia page. But it's like a, mm-hmm. it's a remake of a John Wayne of a John Wayne story. <gasps> That's um, right. That's right. Three wow. Godfathers. Oh. Right. Which is also good. Uh, that one is pretty hilarious because it's um, uh, John Wayne and he he and two other like robbers. They rob a bank, this town. It like cripples this town, and then they just go out into the desert because they uh, they have to, they're trying to get away. And just one thing after another just goes poorly. So it's like kind of like this film in that. All the things go horribly. They almost die of uh, dehydration. They get like shot at and all that stuff. And he finally makes it back and he he circles back to the same town that they robbed. And he's like, well, we found this baby during this. And you know what? I know I'm going to die. You're probably going to kill me or put me in jail. But at least this baby lives. And the whole town's like, yeah, we love you, which is just really hilarious. And John Ford, because it's like he's they still can't process the nuance. Town. They're like, he's good or he's bad, man. He's <laughs> yeah, more exactly. They like, yeah. literally cheer him <laughs> off as he's just like all right he got the, he gets like the lowest sentence it's like i don't know it's the greatest boomer movie ever uh but <laughs> yeah that's what this is based on and this is way more interesting it's got mm, a more yeah, interesting character because it's about them explicitly 
not stealing. They're trying to reunite the uh, like owner. I hate to say that of a baby, but they're, they're trying to reunite yes. the baby with its actual parents. And at the, I mean, eventually Hannah wants to keep it at first. And then uh, is, so it's almost like the reverse of the John Wayne thing. And then I just love mm-hmm. the ways it escalates. And then it sounds like you said everything goes wrong in the John Wayne one. What's interesting to me is the watching it through this time i the thing i came away with most is man it's slathered in christmas magic like serendipity mm. of oh just at the right time or the bag that the old man gave you by chance is money it's the amount of money you need to do this thing and yeah. when you hand the money over the person you hand it to is your long lost daughter it's totally. uh and i think that's what makes it kind of the the execution like sells it when i boil it down I often hate serendipity of this nature, but this movie almost escalates it to its thing, like a system. It's like at every right. beat. And and Hannah, the movie starts with Hannah watching a pageant play and saying, this kid's a Christmas miracle. Magic shit is going to happen for us. Uh, and the theme of the movie is like miracles and serendipity. Mm. So it's one of the few movies where I'll buy it almost because they shot the moon. Like it's serendipitous so often that I'm like, I see you're doing a thing. It's Christmas. It's like right. Christmas magic is happening because yeah. man, and it it expands so adeptly with simple plan payoffs in like a spider web fashion, although there's only three paths, but of course, each of our like homeless folks get a little arc and a little resolution. You learn their whole backstory and there's another emotional beat in the present of like now this is going to happen. You know, by the end, multiple children are reunited with their parents. Mm. And I just forgot how much stuff happens so quickly and how stacked it is with catharsis. <laughs> it's really, it feels like uh, love actually, except I like it more. It was so nice to have all those. Pa- it, it it felt like, um, it did feel like Christmas time specialness um and i think that that helped get that across without feeling cloying and you're right michael that's such a good observation that it's so pervasive throughout the movie that you're like oh, okay this is its thing if one important plot twist hinged on a serendipitousness maybe we would roll our eyes in disbelief but mm. it was uh, yeah you're right so across the board um something that i with the part of my brain that wasn't paying attention to what you were saying which because i'm human does exist even though i was following you closely this is how we converse yes I was also thinking um, one thing that I think the movie did really effectively was give a sense of how big Tokyo is. Um, The city feels huge and like getting from one part of it to another part is a significant journey that involves trains and trudging through snow. And like it just seems to really go and go and go. And I think it, um, you know, it conveys that without resources and like with cash being really, really scarce, it's hard to get across this big city. But then also at the same time, the serendipitous interconnections between like seemingly everybody in the worlds that we saw (laughs) helped also kind of like bring the huge city into a weirdly connected and manageable um, thing, which is like a description of life that I think is nice where like it's gigantic and hugely overwhelming, but there are like connections and synchronicities within it. So that's like an artistic statement that I resonate with personally. Right, totally right. that little I, big town like um seinfeld does that with new york city mm, you're like oh I, they ran into leo on the street there's, there's right. several times that the uh the the serendipity that we're mm-hmm. talking about here like for example there's one scene where hana collapses because she's sick right and uh serendipitously uh they need an ambulance and an ambulance <laughs> crashes into a building mm. nearby so it just literally like god descended here you go and it's just what i love about that one and then i'll make another one is like a cop can't follow a theft because his bike is stolen there's like weird like it's not irony so to uh, so to speak but it's this expectation versus reality thing i think once again he really wants you to go some what well, the thing about serendipity is, serendipity isn't necessarily that you're handed exactly the thing you need at that time that is a part of it but it's also that like it's someone out there is having like an increase like an equally complex situation and they bestow upon you the thing that you need because they need it too it's the tying together of the multiple parts that i think is unique it's not just god hands you something by providence it's everyone has needs and they're needs 
interlock in interesting ways. And I think that exactly like you said, like the density of Tokyo really uh, shows that so many times your expectation of like, you got to be this way. You got to be a father in this way. You got to be a daughter in this way. You got to be a lover in this way. All the stuff that, or even just, you got to be a man or a woman, this woman way. in this way. Yeah. Like 2003 to have Hana the trans, trans experience reflected right. that way is pretty cool. And there, yeah. So it's like, they're saying all this expectation, sometimes that is wrong. And what is right is actually when people are, just doing what they're doing. And it's perfect for a story about saving a baby, which is like yeah. the most potential in the world. It's a really beautiful thought, actually. I, or I mean, Which is obviously. not to say also, as I say that, I want to say that it's not not dated. <laughs> like mm -hmm. there are trans jokes that bug yeah. me. Um, but mostly and you expect like mostly from uh, Gin, who is like rough around right. the edges. He's transphobe. Yeah. And a trans and homophobe. But I guess my point is the movie definitely you can tell almost overwhelmingly is interested in humanizing the experience of yeah. very poor people um right. and like that's part of the journey too because i think if someone has not seen this and is listening to the podcast it almost sounds okay. like um a magic tale of christmas magic and it kind of is but it also has like a woman weeping over a baby she stole and threatening to murder it and it has like um uh, punk kids beating an unhoused guy almost to death in oh, the yeah. gutter. Um, there's really brutal moments and the movie does not shy away from it's like uh, traversing the city, feeding themselves, finding diapers for the baby. It's like if three men and a baby was like on hard mode. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much harder. <laughs> Everything's so hard. Right? Hard mode. Yeah. That's That's so uh, although I got to say the baby's calmer than most babies I've met. Like they got lucky in that regard. He is so babies. cute. They they did they nailed the baby mannerisms animation. Mm. Oh my god, it's such a convincing baby. I was dazzled. Um Hell yeah. I am a cis person, so I will say that I was like on edge for a movie made in 2003 with a trans sure. character front and center, but I from where I sit, and again with the disclaimer that I have not lived the trans experience, I thought the treatment of Hana was respectful and human and um, it seemed pretty good, especially for its time. Yeah. yeah. And had the shades, only... like all three of them have at least two shades of nuance, which is mm -hmm. enough for a well-rounded right. character. You only yeah. got 90 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I thought the, I thought the reuniting the baby with the family stuff, that intrigue was like, not my favorite part. I got a little bored by mm. it and it was, um, less compelling to me than like the insight into their life. Uh, of being unhoused in Tokyo. Um, mm. I, I, I wasn't like, oh man, it's all tying together and resolving. Um, right. But that's okay. It wasn't, I didn't dislike it. Uh, it just wasn't my. It's thing more like a road me. movie. Yeah. It mm -hmm. doesn't seem to like come together like an orchestra would. It goes along and you're like, oh, a new thing's happening now. Right. Oh, a new thing's happening now. Right. And I think, though I'm no student of like international cinema, that some of the pacing and like expectations that I came in with might be attributable to differences between like American film expectations and Japanese film expectations. Just there was some mm. stuff where I was like, oh, there's like a I whole new thing happening now that seems weird and not what i would have guessed <laughs> yeah. at this point um I so think that's often i don't know true. maybe more maybe you'll yeah. have something else to say about that but i mean you get acclimated or you don't but i don't think that's a knock against how you view a film i think you <laughs> you're good you're good man mm -hmm. uh although but I do that's think definitely true for someone who hasn't seen a lot of japanese cinema i would say a really strong case in point that's super cool is uh when act one at the act one to act two break uh, Hana, they do like a postcard freeze and a haiku appears and Hana says, oh. my mother's white breath as she watches me set out on a long Ooh. journey. And then when act two turns to That's act three, they awesome. do the same thing and says, uh, on the year's last day when all of life's accounts are settled up. And I'm like, that's cool. That's, I'm a, you Those know, are good haikus. Yeah, yeah. Great haikus. And to make haikus, your title cards for your chapters is a really neat idea. Yeah. So cool. cool. Very effective. Yeah. Um, yeah, how, yeah. How funny was the Yakuza stuff? I loved that. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, how does the the question for the whole room? How does the Yakuza assassination? Is that like too far? Is, is That's the one moment where I was like, this is happening in this movie? I forgot this. <laughs> this is wild. Is this tied together somehow? Are they yeah. gonna be in this plot? And it's like, no, they just it just well, happens. Gin owed that guy money. 
Yeah. It does give a crucial piece of information as yeah. well. Yeah. And it helps uh it it helps uh uh Mayuki's like travel through like her navigation with her father because she communicates with a mother about how important family is and she reflects on that. But it, so it's like little 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 stabs into the into the right direction mm. uh, yeah speaking of cool little stabs <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah i one of the moments that always kills me is miyuki who's this character who ran away from home because she stabbed her dad mm. who's a cop mm. and she assumes mm. she can't go home oh that's another recurring theme i like that um all three of them even even uh, again by yep. the end uh they all think they can't go home but they find that if they did go home, they would find more forgiveness than they thought they would. Mm, and that's nice. very, mm, that's that gets me. Nice. Um, but the moment is when Miyuki sees in the newspaper that he has a, a personal ad that says Angel came home, dad, because she stabbed him because their cat Angel ran away and she flipped out. Mm. Um, so he's been like trying to get her to come home. And it's sappy. <laughs> yeah, I think this is one of the sappiest movies that still gets me. It's pretty sappy. It it's, is. It is. Because it, I think it does it well, though. It does. Like I think, I think why we don't like sap. Sap is beautiful. What's the difference between sappy and beautiful? I <laughs> sap is argue delicious. that I it is still it's like candy, <laughs> nature's candy. But it, like I I think that the big difference between it is like is it executed well? If it's not, we're like ah, I shouldn't. This shouldn't have gotten me. This is stupid. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But if it's just a beautiful thought, it's just a beautiful thought. I don't know. That's just me. Whereas in <laughs> this, like the moment where. For no reason, impossibly, Hana and the baby are saved by wind, by like, oh. literally, like God just decides. Yeah. It's almost like Hudsucker Proxy. Have you seen that? Time freezes and they're like, this can't happen. This is too depressing. The movie's not going to end this way. And uh, Hana sees the sunlight through the snow after we've been in snow for like two thirds of the movie. Uh, made me my mind think of movies like Brazil, which is one of my favorite movies of mm. all time. Or uh to a lesser extent, The Matrix Three when they emerge from the thing. But I'm like <laughs> I actually think this is one of my favorite like finally seeing the sun moments as well in film. Oh. And there's a good number of those. Beautiful. This one's super effective. Yeah. Beautiful. What mm. about the um just to take it back to the third man space we were in where that was on mic, right? Where we were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Or someone else okay. hit me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, like, so it's interesting to me as we sit here and talk about it that so many of the movie's scenes happen in like subterranean or labyrinthine and or labyrinthine spaces. You know, we're not mm-hmm. like in the mainstream Tokyo. We're in like um, makeshift shelters and like underground hideouts and like the criminal underworld literally underworld and like we're running through tunnels and like people are Graveyards. stepping out of doors and that kind of thing. But then the yeah. climactic scene happens like at the top of a skyscraper and there's all this like level play or not the top of a skyscraper, but the top of an apartment building. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hope the helicopter flying by isn't too distracting. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to think I'm, I'm like, I don't have any analysis yet, but I was thinking through the movie that we get a glimpse into all these underground spaces. And only now is it occurring to me that like, huh? So what does it mean that it winds up at the top, uh, like so high up in the way that it did? And then they kind of are in legit space from there. Like they go to a hospital and, and, you know, Mm -hmm. there's all this stuff like, don't go to the police, like keep it out of the, of, of like state institutions hands. And then at the end, they're like in the hospital the police are there. They're reunited with the with the parents, uh, the proper parents of the baby. And that's when we find out that they're sitting on a bag of cash. They don't know that yet, but they're going to presumably realize at some point soon. Wait, uh, what is that? You know when the old man says, take this and throw it away for me because I don't want anyone to know. It's dirty. Oh, right. Um, there's a short, Use, yeah, there's, a, there's a blink and you miss it shot in the hospital where they pan over, or I think it just cuts and it's an insert of that bag is open and it's a fat stack of cash. Oh, um, yeah, I missed it. And so I would assume yeah. they won't throw it away. <laughs> they're gonna, right. What's interesting is I think they're going to not be homeless now, huh. which, um, well, because he reunited with his daughter. Or maybe right. just Gin will be. I don't know, because Miyuki, I feel like. They all is, have a home now. They all sort of have a home now. Um, and Miyuki's I don't know at if. peace with their dad. I don't know if that's too sappy or like when I put it that way, it makes me go like, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's trying to gloss over the issue of 
unhoused people who can't get resources. I think it's actually very concerned with that. But it is interesting that by the end, their happy ending is they're not mm. homeless anymore. Mm-hmm. That is mm-hmm. pretty extreme. I mean, <laughs> like, it's not that. Yeah, in it's the case Christmas. of Hannah, she's gonna probably return back to the family that kept her. But like the club, yeah, the club. But like at the same instance, that's not. That's just a group of people. It's a family. It's not necessarily like here's a house. They don't right. get houses. There. Mm-hmm. I don't think that uh, you know Jin is gonna move in with his daughter. Um, they're going to still be homeless with the exception. I think of, we don't know what's going to happen to Miyuki. I think Miyuki she probably, will probably move home. She maybe. probably is just going to move home. Yeah, yeah. Just because she's a teenager. So, um, but yeah, uh, or we I hope think that, because she's young. Yeah. I don't know if this was your intention. I assume it was, but just to dial it home, I think that's kind of a direct answer to Zach's question about like the height discrepancy we see through the film. Right. I think home is considered or like, I guess there's like this feeling of normalcy, which is that like you noticed all the photos and flyers everywhere when we do get into the mainstream Tokyo, Tokyo sequences. They're always smiling couples, happy families. Advertisements. And, yeah. Yeah. Nuclear, which is just we see it and we go, well, that's just a part of the world because that's the reality of most big cities. But uh, it's it it's put in a different lens when it's just unhoused people walking around the same kind of uh avenues and halls you know so i think the thing is that we're trying to show kind of like what parasite did uh, you guys i assume have seen that Mm -hmm. film as well kind of the juxtaposition between the two Mm -hmm. different lifestyles that it's i don't think this movie is really trying to like point at the it's not as radical and saying uh these are the these are the parasites the ones on top i think it's actually got a very uh positive message towards like this Tokyo skyline, which is that that look at the the age and history of the things that we built here uh, and the people who are kind of forgotten kind of fall to the bottom. And that's why they're represented on like the lowest at, like area of ge- geographically uh, of the town. And then they literally rise up in the act three. Uh, I think mm. that that's intentional. Mm. Um, I, I know that he's talked about the directors talked about a lot of, uh, of ways in which he wanted to personify the buildings i think that's kind of a Mm. lot like a that's a kind of lost in translation kind of thing because i don't see that happening in like american movies as much where it's like oh this building looks like it has a face but it's also a face that means something like it actually has like a history to it we don't seem to do that with our buildings because i think we just knock them down all the time i don't know i'm just a white guy so i might i might be completely wrong about this but it seems like there's some kind of um solemn grace that goes along with like main like the 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 main skyscrapers the big uh the big buildings in uh in mainland or in uh in tokyo i guess i guess I'm just thinking. I'm here with a cis guy and a white guy. Yeah, what do yeah, I got yeah. left? Yeah, yeah I'm a exactly. cool guy. <laughs> yeah, you're the coolest. Uh, guys. Yeah, I'll just say for this cool guy's money, man. If I'd gotten a writing prompt like this in English class in junior high, uh, your a character finds a baby on Christmas Eve and they have no resources. I'm like, that's a good ass inciting incident. It's just so mm-hmm. strong and propels us immediately. Oh, and the fact that there's a key with the baby with a number on it. I'm like, oh, now we're cooking. Wait a uh, minute, I just got it. The key locker is 1225. Oh. Oh shit. <laughs> December 25th. Yeah. The, what I did get Everything is, is Christmas. that number is also the number somewhere else. Another clue they find is the same number, like the ticket or whatever. So, oh, cool. okay. Everything's okay. Christmas Day. God, oh, okay. it's even more on the nose than I thought. We should, uh, well, we still got a little time, but I'm like, let's not talk this movie through to the point that I think it's sap- too sappy because I really like it and I want to keep liking it. But, uh, okay, the key being 1225 is a little dumb. I mean, we just covered Punch Drunk Love. Uh, which is a great, great film, but there's a point where the character literally has scars on his knuckles that say love, and we always hone in on that. It's like, did they go too far? <laughs> did they ruin it? Is it stupid did they ruin now? It? Is it stupid? Yeah. The 1225 I, kind of is in that bucket for me, but I still funny. love this movie. Yeah. I like all that I wanna... secret stuff that like Jordan Peele lards his movies with. Um, uh-huh. Yeah. And I, I, it's, I think it's fun to figure out, and I always miss it in the movie. Um, Oh my God! What's that Christian Bale movie where he gets skinny? 
The machinist. Thinner? Yes. Oh, the machinist. Yeah. My yeah, girlfriend that's... and I got high and watched that movie, and afterwards we were like, "Oh my god!" Every single thing in the movie Plus tells symbolism. you exactly yeah. what's going to happen the entire time, yeah. and we like kind of rewatched it, and we were like, "Look! Oh my god! It's screaming at you!" Yeah. Interesting. Yep, that's right. I Where wonder did that if culture that come from, film guys? Who started doing that? Like daring us to notice the winks and clever allusions. Oh man, I think that's older than film, to be honest. Well, I do know one uh, but, thing yeah. used in this where the windmill turns and then the old man dies and the windmill stops. Right. It's Isn't that Lawrence joke. of Arabia, the glasses? Mm. That's the first time yeah, we yeah, showed I talk death about through. That a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, something yeah, yeah. Uncle Abe taught me. Uh, uh, I've talked about that on so many podcasts. I'm hell yeah. Tired of it's a good film it. fact. It's because Spiel, Spielberg uses it in every single one of his films. Mm. Uh, and we have a Spiel Boys podcast. That thing uh, where but, someone dies and you cut off camera to like a prop that represented them covered in blood or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It represents kind of like in Jaws, it's the buoy. It's like the violence of under the waves that's just transpired mm. is not seen on the surface, which is just yeah. re- not restless at all. Just, calm as fuck and it's it's a meditation i think on death um but yeah hell yeah i want to talk about a little bit Mm -hmm. something that i didn't understand maybe you guys uh cracked this chestnut which is that one point hana tells uh when they're looking for the child because they lose her uh the the story of the red and the blue devil Mm -hmm. right and it's basically summed up by when you try to achieve something, someone's bound to get hurt. And the blue devil responds, you always have to sacrifice something. And the story is basically this. The red and the blue devil who are seen by devils by this nearby human village, uh, the red devil really, really wants to have human friends, but they're terrified of him. And so in order to kind of uh, make that friendship work, the blue devil says, you know what I'll do? I will essentially... Uh, I'll make sure that I'll like try to like beat them up or something like that. And you'll stop me. And then they'll now they'll love you. And he's like, that's not fair to you. Uh, And this is a saying where Hana says, I am the blue devil. In other words, Hana believes in herself that there's some capacity to be a martyr. And I wonder about what that says about Hana. Like I need to be a martyr or do I want to be a martyr? And I'm not really like at the, in the end she saves the child and doesn't By sacrifice herself. jumping but to her death. She thinks she yeah, will die. Um, she believes she's, and I wondered so about she does, that. Why she, Hana? Because some of them save the day as with good, well-crafted comedies like this, right? They all contribute to saving the baby at the end, but her contribution is specifically jumping off sacrifice. the building. Like yeah. sacrifice. Yeah. And I also think it's notable, or the thing I got from it, right or wrong, was Gin is the Red Devil, right? Mm-hmm. So, yes. and we had just seen the scene where uh, Hana chews him out in front of his daughter, which makes the daughter feel sorry for him and like open up to him. So I thought that that was Hana admitting that she just did that in order to become a common enemy and help Gin reconnect with the daughter. Does that make sense? Wow. Like the wrestler. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What color is she wearing in that scene? I would love to go back. That's a good question. I didn't even think. I think, I mean, they wear the same thing all the time. So she's, she's got that uh, green scarf. Yeah. Right. Right. Interesting. uh, The the animation on her face. Blue light or something like that. Yeah. I would want to go back and scrutinize. Yeah. Me too. The animation on Hana's face in that screaming scene. Again, so good. The, yeah. Like the musculature of her crinkling nose is like. And wow, people yeah. in this movie, while we're on animation, I think the slipping and sliding and running looks yeah. so good in this movie. People's legs, because they're like amorphous, they're almost impressionistic. And like, uh, what was the other thing I thought looked so cool every time it happened? Mm. I guess it was just the running. But yeah, so for good. some for a movie that doesn't take us to space or, I mean, paprika, I can't make head or tails if anyone understands paprika please feel free write me a long twitter dm (laughs) explaining paprika i'd be into that um 
But yeah, I, I'm, I'm super into the look of it. Oh, I remember. It's how weirdly animated the face of the deadbeat dad is when you finally meet the oh, deadbeat yeah. real bio yeah. dad of, of Kyoko. He's, His face he's otherworldly. is like animated in such a cool otherworldly way. Yeah. The hoarder yeah. dude. They, they choose their moments in this movie because there's times in Hana is like, which I think is one of the things that really shows the 2003 and also ch- shows the culture that like kind of spun this tale. Mm-hmm. Uh, not not in any bad way, but we all have you know the past is a little weird when it comes to transgenderism. Let's it's I don't think that's a bold thing to say. The present uh, is yeah. <laughs> the present is yeah. So I totally understand someone not wanting to watch this because it does have that kind of uh, bigotry in mm-hmm. it. It's uh, it's not the film saying this is right. Like sometimes we have films that are going that way. It's like this should be corrected and that's bullshit but in this film there are times that they kind of play hana as a joke because they animate her face to be more like a man versus a woman or they say like she has really big feet or whatever yeah yeah yeah, i mean it's one thing when Jin is just ragging on her Mm because i can just say that's Jin being an asshole Mm because he's an asshole but it's different when the filmmaker is saying like to play for a joke when she when she's blowing up at Jin and saying like how dare you lie to everyone mm-hmm. and make it seem like you are the one who has fallen on hard times when actually when you're at just a every deadbeat. Yeah. moment you're a deadbeat uh and in that animation i feel like there's times where it's like in order to become strong and to say some of the stuff that she says she has to mm. become a man again and i didn't like that i see uh, but that may be me reading into interesting it. yeah I didn't Interesting. pick up on that per se. I just thought there were various like, like highly you mobile. See the everyone's eyeshadow. everyone's face is highly mobile in this, especially That's when we get true. into those close ups. Yeah. That's why I wanted to mention it because like I feel like I could be talked down from it just mm-hmm. by the idea of like, well, technically everyone is sometimes a cartoon for no reason. This is a moment where like or there's a moment in this film where uh, he says, "Like man, these cat. I'm so hungry, and these cats. Man, I really wish I could have." No, he says, cats "Did you ever wonder know. how cat meat tastes?" Yeah, <laughs> You're the cats immediately, like tastes. all of the cats, like are immediately angry, like they heard and understand exactly what he's saying. It's yeah. like a cartoon sometimes too. So yeah, I get it. I get An- it. Another slapstick moment that I felt was like I sensed was embodying some like anime tropes that I you know, again, could sense, but wasn't like totally versed in was when, um, the like charades scene where Gin is acting out like what happened and which way they need to run. But he's like, so out of breath that he can't talk oh, and right. he's turning red. That mm-hmm. was like very wacky. Um, it's vaudeville. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know what, when you're highlighting that moment, there's sometimes where this movie almost feels like life is beautiful. If you've ever seen that, it's that mix mm. That's of right. serious darkness and serious mm. optimism a- in the face of it anyway. Uh, and we don't get that a lot. We don't. No. There's not a lot of movies about forgiveness, you know, uh, recently. Right. Have you noticed this? I feel I feel like that, that's kind of, that one of the reasons I really enjoyed it. But hey, Vengeance. Now, vengeance is cooler than forgiveness. Vengeance <laughs> is cool. Look, I'm not going to throw Vengeance under the bus mm-hmm. for this. Unless it but, fucks with you, then you will as revenge. <laughs> But uh, and there are forgiveness films made recently. I'm not a monster here. I'm just saying that that's something that this movie really harps on. Mm -hmm. So if you're not into that, then you're not going to be super into this because it is like kind of wall to wall a a story that is crafting this kind of, uh, you know, crescendo that is, well, if you just forgive, everything Mm -hmm. is going to be great. Actually, uh, everything everywhere all the time. That's all probably once. the most recent. Yeah. All once, sorry. Uh, that's probably the most recent film that I've seen that has that message that in its act three. I'm also sorry if it's Jin. I watched the dubbed version, so they say Gin in that. I don't know what it should be, quote unquote. But oh uh, yeah, I'm pretty bad at yeah, that yeah, stuff yeah. too. Mm. Yeah, Gin Miyuki and Han. Correct us. That's in what I the got. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a good use of the comments. That'll yeah. stick. When we cover Tokyo Godfathers again dumbness. next month, then um, it'll really come we'll, in handy. We'll correct ourselves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it's good to know. It's good to know. Sometimes you don't ha- you do not do all of your research because you're doing other things. And you know what? I'm sorry, but, you know, life is what it is. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, it was a lot about forgiving yourself, huh, Abe? 
uh, ultimately? That's, uh, that's actually a really good question though, because like our main, like one of our main characters, right? He, we're asking him to forgive himself. He is in a weird way, like not, uh, is he redeemable? He's done some terrible things. Um, that's a question I think that, uh, the director, the writers are asking us, right? He also hits Miyuki at the top of the movie and cops a feel, even though she's that's apparently wild. underage or we get the, yeah, he's a pretty, right. like, he's a pretty is- like, uh, ribald wino as far as winos go. In I retrospect, mean, cre- that's a weird, yes, that is a, it's a weird start. Sort of, yeah. But maybe it's not like it's one of the first things. He's forgiven, but what does he do to redeem himself is I guess the question I meant to ask. Um, mm. Well, he saves up money that he intends to give his daughter and that's then he true. doesn't. Um, he true. gets his ass beat in order to get a photo that leads them to the baby. That's but true. yeah, but I guess that is what I, that's what I mean when Saving I say that I wonder if the Christmas magic in some places is used to ease. Like, I don't know if this is positive or negative. All I can say is when this unhoused guy who's done nothing really to be redeemed other than he does have a good heart, like he generally wishes well, but he doesn't do good things. And Mm. for the first two thirds, he's the one constantly saying, I don't care about this Mm. baby. Let's just give up. Can we just give up? We're homeless people. Who cares? Um, the fact that he could run into his daughter and his daughter could go, oh, dad, we've missed you so much. I've been wanting. All I care about is to see you again. It makes me choke up and I feel really touched. And I don't know if that's how that would really go. <laughs> you right. know, exactly. that pat exactly. or that like, well, it goes very smoothly for him, for sure. Mm-hmm. 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 Um, but yeah. Miyuki, I believe, because I do feel like a young person and a parent, obviously they're going to forgive you, dude. Just go home. Right. You know There's also I mean? a misunderstanding because the idea was that she thought her overbearing father like got rid of the cat, the one thing she loved, and was like, you just want to make my life like uh, uh, you just want me to have the worst life. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, the cat ran away. I had nothing. And to then do you with stabbed it. me. And then you stabbed <laughs> you me. And stabbed you, me. <laughs> it doesn't. The movie does not try to go into the, the fact that he was overbearing. Uh, there's mm-hmm. no solvency for that. It's just on to the next part of the journey, uh, which I think is why the she's a great character in yeah. this because even though she's a godfather, she's so young. It shows the potential, you know. Uh, shows like, well, the stories are gone going. It's not like, like w- with Jin or again, you get the feeling that it's like, okay, this is reaching towards not like in the November, December years, you know, it's like kind of like we're getting to a point where it's like, if you, you can redeem yourself, you got a few shots left with, uh, Miyuki. It's like, you got your whole life in front mm, of you. Right. Mm. You know? And you see three boobies, one in the snow. <laughs> So oh, yeah. it's a good movie all around. <laughs> a movie, a movie that, or a moment that actually really hit me that you just made me think of for Miyuki is uh, when she earlier sort of makes fun of her mom and he goes, and all my mom does is pray, oh God, oh God, and like does a mimic, like a funny yes. quote unquote mimic of praying fervently. Then later we cut back to when she stabbed her dad and her mom's in the background praying like that. that and you're exact- like, oh. Well, she's praying that way because she just saw you stab your father. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Shit just got put in a very real context. And the movie's good at, I mean, it's a very good at contrasting. And it basically just alternates, like much like the Ferris wheel in the third man. Uh, (laughs) High points and low points. And you're like, now I feel good. Now this feels really dark. Now I feel good again. (laughs) It's a pretty even mix. It's slippery, man. Yeah, it's slippery. Well, they do that with the religion. It's true, dude. Lot. It's all execution. Six Feet Under is just a soap opera, but it's done so well. I don't feel that way. I I, th- right. I feel it's like that's a real right. show or whatever. Yeah, no, that's a good. That's a good, good touch point. Uh, yeah, re- it does that with religion a few times, doesn't it? I noticed this time around, religion is not well portrayed, despite being like the thematic center of the movie, which is that like God and providence might save you if you ask it to uh it's we we're seeing like we make fun of religion which doesn't mean that it's bad but we do see that opening sequence did you know guys notice that like uh 
the way that we start our opening image of the three of them are or two of them is that they're at a homeless or a, at a church function that is like you'll get a show and you'll get some food you'll get a nativity scene you'll get some food but then we're gonna have a priest come out and sermonize you christmas pageant and shit yeah 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 and it was like and he and the and the filmmakers decided to put a shot right during that the sermon which was that like these are the three things you'll get like here's brass tacks like hey unhoused people Mm -hmm. these are what you're going to get out of this deal but when we cut to the sermon the sermon is like you got to do this and you got to give more telling the unhoused to give more is like a weird like this is a weird sermon to do for the home for home well and repeatedly we see that like the respectable quote-unquote well-to-do people are drawn as super sloppy, drunk, demanding. Right. Like they run afoul of several people who like seem worse off than them in terms of being aggro and out of control, right? But are yeah. dressed nicely. Uh, and yeah, I think there's definitely some parasite esque playing with like fuck high class people. We're rooting for the low class people, of course, yeah, as yeah, you'd yeah. expect given what the plot is. Yeah. Right, right, right. And, and I mean, the concept that like, poor people are the most generous people um, to each other is, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is like a, is a, a fr- one that I've encountered frequently. And in mm. fact, in the movie, they do wind up giving extremely generously of themselves. Um, and seeming like it's, it ain't even a question, you know, they're plunking yeah. down train fa- fare and rolling their eyes and saying, what if we have to unlock another locker? But you know, yeah. 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 Even Gin or Jin is like not even like he's he, a lot of the time he's like, I don't know if we can do this. Like, we're not the right ones to do this. We should give it to the police kind of deal. Mm-hmm. But even then, even early on, he's the one who's like, I know how raising a child works. You got to warm up the bottle, get some water, you know, and stuff like that. I'm I'm supporting you, Hana, you know, like because I cl- you clearly want this and the baby needs it like he's not. He's still all, he's still going to go to bat for the human race. You know what I mean? And I for his believe- little fake family, for sure. <laughs> yes. I didn't believe him when he was giving up. I mean, you know, yeah, when yeah, he gave yeah, up, exactly. he needed to numb the feeling of failure with, like, exactly. that's when we see him start mm. pounding that bottle of alcohol. And he never right. gave up. I mean, he kept fighting and trying to find him and, you know, he just him hates forward. himself. Yeah, he calls him. There's a whole. That's actually a really funny sequence. Is when he calls himself trash, and he's like, "I gotta get rid of some trash." He goes to the police. Oh yeah, guy hands out a waste, waste bin. He's like, "I can't fit in there." <laughs> <laughs> I got a simple joke, away. very effective. Yeah, and uh, I think that that duality is really encapsulated in that moment in the cemetery where they finally see diapers and formula mm. from nowhere, mm-hmm. seemingly, and as an offering on a grave. And they're like, Hannah says, "See." God like loves this baby. And they're like, then why did we find it in a dumpster essentially? <laughs> <laughs> so the movie does both of those things really well. Um, Cause by the end you are like, that's a magic ass baby. This baby that's cannot magic. die. This baby is magic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Baby cannot be killed. That's that baby's Jesus. Uh, what's with putting babies in public lockers? Is that a thing? Is this like a pop culture blind spot? I played a game. Hmm. Is like I've only encountered that in this. What's the other thing? Really? A video game? I played a, a game called Yakuza, where mm-hmm. the plot involved not one, but two babies in public lockers. Oh, I haven't like gotten that movie. far in Yakuza. Zero? Yeah, li- like a dragon. Like a dragon, like a dragon, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and there's I've seen huh. another movie. There's locker I babies. I can't remember the title okay. of it. Locker babies. I don't know. Is that a thing? Or is that the urban legend there? Like we have dumpster bit because definitely dumpster baby is the thing that I heard in junior high. Maybe it's just right. Mm -hmm. Hmm. But it's Mm. weird that it's like yakuza tide as well. It's like something yakuza's do to babies. (laughs) I was like, is that a thing? But it probably not. Well, it's interesting to see them bring in the yakuza whenever they want. Just like we're like, and there's some mobsters there whenever we want. That's very, (laughs) very convenient. (laughs) They save the Don from being crushed by his own car. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. All right. That's right. Well, that's all. I mean, that's all my major thoughts, Abe. I I'm, mean, we, I'm making yeah, wrap we up. What do you it. think? I love it. Me too. And what I love is sometimes we get really bogged down in a beat by beat synopsis and we did not do that. So I bet there's a lot of people listening who haven't seen it. Hopefully you bailed. Uh, 
a third of the way through this podcast to go watch it because I still endorse watching this movie after watching it. Uh, thank you for selecting it, Zach. Excellent oh, choice. Of yeah. course. I'm so glad I got to be enriched by it. Heck yeah. And I can't tell you how grateful I am you reached out. Uh, if people are like me and they want to, well, they only get half of the equation. But if people want to maintain a distant parasocial relationship with you, where can they find you? Stay abreast of what you're doing. What are you working on lately? All that good stuff. Well, I'll tell you that I noticed that um, if you take the phrase Tokyo Godfathers, um, it like spanning the two words on the space in between them is the word yoga. Like Tokyo. Yo. Oh, no, it's yoga. Yoga. Never mind. Scratch that. Yeah. You only <laughs> go once. <laughs> yoga. You only yeah. go once. That's so funny. <laughs> um, I, I bring that up because m my brain does that wordplay stuff all the time. And oh, it yeah, used to be sure. uncomfortable, but now I have the crossword show, this project that I made up where I yes. dump all my wordplay energies into. Um, it's nice. my favorite thing. It's like my magnum opus. And I'll just plug, since we're here, that we're going on tour next month, July. Um, and uh, we'll be doing a bunch of shows on the East Coast. A small bunch, but still a bunch. And... Uh, all the info on that is on my website, which is crosswordshow.com. Loading great, the tab great. now. Hell yes. Sweet. And we'll put it in the description. Thank so that you, people guys. Can... I'll quickly yeah. describe it just in case Please. it tantalizes. That's, when I was done typing, I was going to ask that next. <laughs> Here's how it works. The elevator pitch version is that it's a panel of guests solving a crossword puzzle live on stage um, that I host. But the slightly deeper description is... I don't make crossword puzzles, but I now work with a different New York Times published crossword maker for every show that I make. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've written five crossword shows so far. And so they make the grid and then I write the clues, which work like normal crossword clues, but they also happen to function as rhyming rap lyrics. So there's an across clues rap and a down clues Ooh. rap over the course of the show. And then... Every time the solvers get a word right, we do some material, whether it's like comedy or music or wordplay or trivia, whatever it is, inspired by whatever the answer word that they just figured out is. Mm -hmm. And then the show ends with a grand finale rap where I cleverly, I say it advisedly or with self-awareness, but I cleverly weave together all the words from the grid into like a, the answers rap that closes out wow. the show. It is my mm -hmm. favorite thing, man. Right. I'm excited oh, my just own. talking about it. Oh, Hell and the yeah. past solvers thing, man. You got Itsuko Katsuki, you got Aparna Nancherla, Rachel Bloom, River Butcher, Scott Thompson, Solomon Giorgio. I got to get seriously into this. Yeah. I can't believe I'm not already I mean, hip my deep in this crap. Lisa yeah, my, Loeb. Wow, Lisa Loeb. Stay fame. Yeah. The mm, firecracker? I Lisa do. Loeb? I yeah. do. <laughs> Phenomenal. All right. Well, thanks for listening, y'all. Thank you to thanks, Zach. A final time. And thanks for I don't having know, me. Thanks, Abe, I guess. No oh, thank thanks you, me. <laughs> Abe, Abe, your last name is Epperson, right? That's right. So your name can be split differently to spell a beep person. I don't even really know what that means, but if you do any profanity mm -hmm. muting in your day-to-day -day life in any way, that could be. I am into swears, so yeah. I'm going to use that. Right. I'm going to use that. You're the kind well, of person who needs person. Uh, and Shh. can I just say as my closing thing, I will send you that list of um of one-sentence email capsules that my the friend Ian sent me. I think you'll be amused. That will be fun. And yeah. um, I you mentioned Barton Fink earlier, Michael. And <laughs> yes, I, have, I usually I do. I have a friend who once told me that I looked like Barton Fink, and in one of my rap videos that's on <laughs> YouTube, we did a one-shot recreation of a scene from the movie with me dressed up just like him. So I'll send you a link which, to that, too. Oh, which, please yeah, do. Yeah, which, which scene? Which scene? I, I like He's lying. I don't even know. He's lying on his back with his arms behind his head on, like, an interestingly one. patterned bedspread. That's right. Mosquito that's right. involved it's the, at all? Uh, no, it's not the mosquito shot. It's the uh, drain shot the drain shot the infamous drain Remember shot drain. that we don't know yeah. what it means yeah mm -hmm. all right great so that's the show <laughs> and as we fade out all glory and honor to the true star of frame rate ian mm -hmm. good job ian <laughs> <laughs> this has been a small beans endeavor we're a bunch of pals who make podcasts sketches music web series and movies the beans always have new ideas percolating so make sure to check us out at patreon.com slash small beans that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash small beans where you can browse all of our current and past content see what we've got planned in the future and learn how your support can help the small beans grow into huge giant monster beans 
If you enjoyed this content module, please like, rate, subscribe, or tell a friend about us. We love you!